indigenous peoples who continue to shape the evolution of this territory, the centuries of knowledge that indigenous cultures carry about this region, and the impact of contemporary indigenous knowledges and commitments to social justice in transforming our institution. I'm very happy this evening to welcome you all on behalf of Women's, and Genders, Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies to the Winter 2019 New Feminist Research Lecture. Um, this is our 10th in the series, an initiative initially launched by Dr. T.L. Cowan to highlight the cutting edge feminist research of contemporary non-tenured faculty and public intellectuals who are making significant contributions to national and international debates in the field. Dr. Cowan is currently Assistant Professor of Digital Media Cultures in the Department of Arts, Culture and Media at the University of Toronto. And because it's our 10th anniversary, I just want you to have a sense of the amazing caliber of the people, including our present speaker, who have participated in this series. We began with Dr. Ilya Parkins, who is the WGS coordinator from UBC Okanagan. Her talk was entitled Timing Femininity in Christian Dior's Self-Fashioning, a looking at Dior's design history as a form of autobiography. Dr. Jasmine Rolt is currently assistant professor with the Institute of Communication, Culture, Information and Technology at U of T Mississauga and she presented on Mediating Affect in the Queer Americas, Cases of Creative Resistance on effective approaches to creative street activism. Dr. Trish Salah, now associate professor in our sister program at Queen's University, spoke on gender struggles, trans organizing, trade unionism, and radical communities linking transgender justice to struggles of working class and colonized peoples around the world. Trish hosted the first transgender minority literatures conference in Canada in May of 2014. Dr. Tiffany Mueller Myrdal, now senior lecturer at Simon Fraser's Gender, Sexuality, Women, and Urban Studies program, held the Ruth Wynne Woodward Chair in Gender and Urban Studies while serving on the board of our national urban design organization, Women Transforming Cities, when she gave her talk, Emerging Feminist Urban Futures. Then, writer Melanie Schnell, who some of you may have seen the other day, presented a talk on her research in Somalia and the writing process for her award-winning novel, while the sun is above us. Her talk, recounting, recounting the truth of war through feminist fiction, emphasized the power of feminist writers to bring the lived impact of diverse women's realities to public consciousness. She now teaches at the University of Virginia. Mary Bunch, former Shirk postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Sexual Diversity Studies at the University of Toronto and coordinator of Women's and Gender Studies at McGill University, presented on Julia Kristeva, Disability and the Singularity of Vulnerability, examining Kristeva's work as a critical disabilities activist and thinker, whose interactionist theory rejects neoliberal assimilation, uh, calling instead for cultural revolution. Then, Dr. Manuela Valle Castro, who grew up under the military dictatorship in Chile and completed her PhD through UBC's Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice Institute, gave a lecture on performance as activism and utopia in the Americas, exploring lines of convergence and difference across social movements in Latin America and performance activism in Canada, including the Idle No More movement. Eleanor Sunchild, a proud member of Third uh, Thunder Child First Nation and member of the Saskatchewan Bar since 1999, presented her talk, The Impacts of Settler Colonial Violence on Indigenous Women, which addressed the continuing legacies of the Indian Act, the residential school system, the 60s scoop, and the genocidal impacts of Canadian colonial policies on Indigenous women. Last year, Dr. Prabhu Pilar, a diasporic mestiza woman from Colombia with a PhD in performance studies, feminist theory, and research from UC Davis, and postdoc in visual humanities and new media from U Winnipeg, presented her talk situated embodied resistance to 21st century necro-techno-colonialism to interrogate the role of doctrine of discovery in supporting a global apparatus of surveillance capitalism. So pretty amazing crew, and we're so pleased because all of those ones got away. <laughs> we get to have with us tonight um, uh, Mirella Davis. So for our 10th presentation, um, I'd just like to introduce Marilla as Assistant Professor in Modern Chinese History 
Women and Gender Studies at the University of Saskatchewan. She's written many, many articles, and her dissertation, Free Love, Marriage, and Eugenics, Global and Local Debates on Sex, Birth Control, and Venereal Disease in Population in 1920s and 30s China, was supported by an NYU Mellon Dissertation Award in History and the Provost Global Research Fellowship at NYU in Shanghai. Tonight, Morella will examine the work of radical women's activist Yi Haiyan, captured in the documentary Hooligan Sparrow, how many have seen it? You're gonna rush home and watch it, I swear. <laughs> in which internationally acclaimed Chinese female director Nan Fu Wang investigates activist responses to sexual assault in China. Drawing on Judith Butler and other theorists, Mirella will explore how feminist filmmakers and activists are addressing internet and film censorship, as well as harassment and imprisonment by the Chinese state. As you can see, her talk is entitled Hooligan Sparrow, Representation of Sexual Assault in Chinese Cinema, Sexual Assault Activism in China, and the Limits of Me Too in the Face of Male-Dominated State Power. Let's give Mirella a moment. And uh, by the way, you can watch the film on Netflix. <laughs> so very convenient. <laughs> okay, so this talk examines the activities of radical uh, women's rights activist Ye Haiyan, who has appropriate uh, a negative term, and whose story was captured in the documentary Hooligan Sparrow. Yeah, I refer to the term hooligan, uh, by which she is described often by the Chinese media. This documentary breaks with many taboos in Chinese cinema. It is the first internationally acclaimed documentary uh, by a Chinese female director to center upon investigating the activities of a sex and women's rights activist in China, as well as to address the controversial and politically sensitive topic of sexual assault in China. This is the first uh, study to address uh, the cinematic contributions of Wang Nanfu, who is the director, and uh, also Ye Haiyan's activist, or to treat the representation of sexual violence as a topic of concern in Chinese cinema. So nothing was done on this topic, but interesting. Uh, this talk examines the feminist activist writings posted on the online social media accounts of Ye Haiyan on Sina Weibo, an influential Chinese social media platform. Um, between 2013 and 2014, and on Twitter, to which she took after 2015, when her Weibo account was shut down. But she still writes in Chinese, she can't write in English. Um, so this talk will show the, how female director subjectivities uh, bring productive representations of sexual violence in Chinese cinema and uh, a bit on my theoretical framework. Uh, according to Judith Butler, the <coughs> formation of politics that represents women as the subject of feminism um, is itself a discursive formation and effect of a given version of representational politics. The feminist subject is thus constituted by the political system through which emancipation is sought. This is a good way to understand the relationship between Chinese politics and Chinese feminists, but also how Weibo uh, first gave feminists a social media platform to voice their concerns, but yielded to state power to mold the feminist subject. For a subjectivity to emerge, says Butler, uh, one has to first be subjective. Thus, the relationship between feminism in China and state power. Butler also states that the subject of women is not a historical or universal, but rather contingent upon its political and social environment. Therefore, Ye Haiyan's activist has to be understood as resistance to state and local police suppression of women's rights activists and feminists in China. Given state clampdown of feminist activists, the limits of Me Too in China will also be addressed. Um, drawing on uh, Gayatri Spivak's question, can the Salvatore speak? Uh, this talk also interrogates the possibility of uh, female activist Salvatore voices and the possibility of capturing the subjectivity of sexual assault survivors. 
so uh, this talk also engages in presenting an ontology of Chinese feminists from which Chinese feminist perspectives in their uh, from the Chinese feminist perspectives in their daily struggles with the Chinese state. Uh, so the following uh, research questions will guide my talk. Um, what does it mean to be a feminist activist in contemporary China? In what way can Chinese feminist activists form of community of action and can impact social change? What are the limits of activists in the face of overwhelming male-dominated state power? What is the connection between activists and participatory documentary? What is the role of female subjectivity in directing documentaries that include the theme of sexual assault? Um, uh, so this is the poster of the film, uh, which is a uh, really requires little commentary, but just to tell you that, <laughs> um, yeah, you can see here the police and uh, the sparrow, right? But uh, her name is Yen. Yen means sparrow, right? So Yung Mang Yen, Hooligan Sparrow. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's a, I think it's a great poster. And maybe if you can play the trailer. I want to show you just two minutes from the, uh, the trailer um, so that we can get a sense. This afternoon, I'm going to meet with the national security agents who will come to see me at 3 o'clock and investigate on what I've been doing during the summer. Woman在海南上学校长带女生开房,其实他就是重大的数字。海南这种事情在中国发生无数次,所以我们来到海南准备继续抗议,不想让罪犯再次逃脱。With so much attention focused on the case, the government reacted. also due to the lax enforcement of existing rape laws. Sexual harassment in overcrowded spaces, public buses, or subways is common in post-socialist countries, lacking adequate sex education and gender studies programs, and China is no exception. Activists to bring awareness to sexual assault has to contend with a lack of um, political and youth activists uh, involvement in the post Tiananmen era where political repression has been oppressive. The Chinese government <coughs> is uh, wary of public protests, human rights, feminist and LGBT activists, 
in the post Tiananmen era and has demonstrated an aggressive pursuit of labor rights and human rights lawyers, including harassment and imprisonment of prominent and vocal activists, especially under Xi Jinping's leadership, who, if you don't know, is president forever, for life. Um, me Too in China, uh, which is called Weishu, um, I am also kind of the same, uh, and feminist activism is intersectional, including female activists, LGBTQ activists, Chinese nationals, and Chinese diaspora, and overseas Chinese students. Um, so just to a short history of Me Too in China, Luo Tian was the first woman in China to accuse publicly an academic who sexually harassed her. And femi uh, feminist activist Zhang Leilei started organizing and mobilizing public opinion in China on sexual assault. More than 9,000 students from 70 universities expressed their support online and shared their stories of sexual harassment, uh, which according to feminist uh, Liu Ping, um, had university policy changing implications, both for the Ministry of Education and for some uh, universities. This was the re a result of uh, student uh, organizing efforts. Um, and it's been said that this is probably the largest student movement protest since uh, the pro-democracy movement um, in June 4th, which you know, ended badly with the Tiananmen Square massacre. Um, Chinese Me Too activists see themselves as part of a global community of activists. But this is what they have to contend with. The arrest the rest of five feminist activists in 2015, right on the eve of uh, you know, March 8, kind of where we are now, um, sent shockwaves uh, through the women's uh, movement in China, and uh, the reason they were arrested was because they were planning to uh, organize some LGBT awareness work and some activities uh, regarding sexual harassment. Um, so this is way before the Me Too. Uh, but Me Too in China, unlike in the US, started in universities paying close attention the development in the US. In China, feminist activists circumvent government censorship by the use of virtual private networks, or VPNs, uh, ensuring a safe encrypted internet connection. Though lately, these don't work anymore. Um, so, According to Lupin, Chinese feminist activists have their own interpretation of Me Too, one that is localized but also global. Chinese feminist activists who have been organizing years before the Me Too exploded on the global stage can now garner international attention thanks to uh, the global Me Too movement. However, before the global Me Too movement, Chinese feminist activists like Ye Haiyan were already protesting energetically against the local government authorities' handling of sexual assault and molestation cases in China recognizing the vulnerability of young girls. Uh, sexual molestation of schoolgirls is particularly egregious, contested, and disturbing on a background of weakness in child uh, protective services in China. Uh, so now I want to talk to you about Hooligan Sparrow, the activist documentary, and Wang Nanfu, the documentarian as participant. The documentary, Hooligan Sparrow, tells the story of Ye's activist protest against authorities in the case of six elementary school children who had been led to a hotel room on Hainan Island by a school principal and a local official. The documentary contains some shocking um, activist images and shows Ye Haiyan's uh, radicalism. Um, of using frontal nudity for her activist work. Ye engages in what Wang names confrontational activism. Hooligan Sparrow begins with a shot of the documentarian as participant. Uh, so 
so you remember Wang's, uh, Wang's face. We get a glimpse of a young female director, Wang Nan Fu, who at the time was still an NYU graduate student, saying, that's me with the camera. Wang starts with her own positionality because she wants to address the issue of censorship and state suppression of feminist activism. The first shot shows Wang preparing a hidden uh, microphone under her skirt to catch an audio tape of her interview with the National Security Agency. While shooting, Wang even resorts to using spy glasses, uh, which unfortunately the police also use, so they discover them quite quickly <laughs> and destroy them. Uh, to evade the police, Wang often travels by bus, as it does not require an ID uh, like traveling by train does, which is much more comfortable. Uh, Wang made the documentary a great personal risk, smuggling her footage out of China through friends, and so can no longer return to China uh, because of the explosives for political content of the documentary. Wang identifies strongly with the background of Ye Haiyan. As she tells us in the documentary, like me, Ye is from a poor farming village. Wang's own story of becoming a documentarian is remarkable as it is unlikely. Her father died when she was only 12 years old. She did not even have a TV until she was a teenager. Various scholarships carried her from her village in Jiangxi province to Shanghai um, and to grad school in the United States. Throughout the documentary, we see glimpses of how Wang hides herself and her camera from the Chinese police. The most harrowing scene that you saw even in the trailer, uh, where Wang herself is a protagonist, shows Wang and Yasin, yes, a young daughter, being chased by the police up the stairs while staying at a friend's apartment because they have been kicked out of their apartment. The camera still shoots hallucinatory frantic images and the sound of their laboring breaths gives the viewer in suspense in what could be called an aesthetics of fright on flight. Um, so this documentary makes an important contribution to the independent documentary movement in China by bringing to light the topic of sexual assault and uh, state suppression of feminist activists through a gendered lens. Using feminist aesthetics, I will unpack the power dynamic in this documentary as well as the interplay between the filmmaker's subjectivity and the female rights activist subjectivity. Um, so Wang lived, uh, this is Ye, Wang lived with Ye Haiyan uh, in the summer of 2013. According to Wang, by living together, the experiences of her subjects becomes hers, and this also changed her own experience. Thus, even uh, if uh, Wang initially wanted to make a documentary about, uh, yes, um, very radical sex work uh, activists. The topic changed according to Ye's uh, own activism at the time. Uh, Wang's encounter with Ye's, Ye Haiyan's work also made her into an activist filmmaker. And Wang hopes her film can help free the human rights activists in China through international pressure. The documentary itself has a non-linear narrative. We are introduced to some characters that will reveal themselves later on, such as the local police authorities dressed in plain clothes. Uh, so there are several stories that are intertwined. For example, we're shown um, how um, the media distorted the survival story, the censorship, uh, of the local media, how Ye is harassed by a brothel owner where she previously worked as a sex worker, uh, also sex worker activist, this I will talk about later, and by the local police. Uh, yes, dislocation and Wang Nan's full interrogation. Wang is very conscious of the documentarian's ability to manipulate time by choosing a moment in time that is significant for storytelling. According to Wang, through editing, a director can choose to slow time, to speed it up, to use flashbacks and flash forwards. She put to good use uh, those devices 
by introducing us to a few characters early on in the documentary. One example was when she highlighted a father ha riding a moped with his children, which by the way is quite, quite common in China, uh, that was watching Ye Haiyan's protest, only to reveal later on that he was the father of a child survivor of sexual assault. Actually one of the children, or one of the six children. A shocking picture of a young girl's underwear smeared with blood is captured by Wang, one that the desperate parents have made public in hopes to get justice for their daughter. Ye Haiyan uh, was critical of warning city's authorities in Hainan province who were afraid that the parents of the victims would contact lawyers from Beijing. She described the reluctance of the parents to meet with the activists for fear of being followed by the police. Ye recognized both the agency of the parents whose children have been sexually abused, demanding that they have a say in the proceedings, as well as expressed her criticism of the inaction of the Women's Federation, which has long been a sort of mouthpiece for CCP interests, and just recently they've uh, totally uh, criticized uh, kind of Western feminist uh, frameworks that criticize uh, you know, Chinese politics. So. Uh, so it's not exactly a feminist organization. According to Ye's criticism of the local authorities, the legal framework that allows sex offenders to get away with light penalties needs to be reworked to exclude the charge of prostitution in cases involving sex with a minor. So Ye often writes on her posters, abolish the guilt of spending the night with a young girl prostitute. Ye wants to critique the legal framework that can controversially assign guilt to an underage girl by association with prostitution. Speaking about the possibility of the consciousness of the subject, uh, such as the widow who immolates herself on the farm in India, Gayatri Spivak shows us why uh, that is impossible, because of the epistemic violence of imperialist law. Likewise, it is very difficult to get at the consciousness of molested girls because of the epistemic violence of this narrow legal framework that uh, further victimizes them. So this kind of law doesn't exist right in the West, but um, China is very particular. Uh, moreover, Ye writes she will resist till the end. Thus, Ye appeals to a foundational uh, con feminist concept of resistance that guides her feminist activists by resisting the scrutinizing grace, gaze and the pressure from the local authorities, but also by circumventing government agents who are following her all the time. Furthermore, Ye speaks as a mother of concerned citizens and as a human rights activist. After having found out that she was investigating Kwan Si Pai, Ye Haiyan, who at the time was, uh, was on Hainan Island, wrote on Wei Po that her child was alone at home and that if something would happen to her daughter, it would be the government's fault. Um, she also pleaded with the government to stop harassing her. In the documentary, the activist and the filmmaker put out a startling disclaimer that shows their fears and the risks they were taking. If anything happened, please try to find me. At great personal risk, Wang continued shooting guerrilla style despite being pursued by the police. The documentary received a nomination for Sundance 2016 Grand Jury Prize and was shortlisted for the 2016 Oscar in the feature length category. And uh, thank God it didn't win because that would have made yes life help. Um, so there is also a Chinese version of the documentary and Wong is doing some underground screenings in China. An official screening in China is unlikely because of the overt criticism of the Chinese authorities. Now, I want to tell you a bit about Ye Haiyan. Uh, she's an unabashed feminist who drives a pink moped. <laughs> I know this because uh, she put a picture on it. Her most uh, famous hashtag, hey principal, get a room with me, and I'm going to show a picture of it. Um, 
received many replies with pictures from people with this hashtag from both men and women, women of all shapes and sizes. Uh, as a result of this online campaign, uh, Ye was criticized in the Chinese media for showing um, self-display or self for self-show. This makes little sense in English, but this is what they say in Chinese. Um, Ye responded that not all media is so ignorant and devoid of morality as the ones who are attacking her instead of talking about the vulnerability of primary school children. He also criticized the shameless um, online public opinion, drawing attention to a very serious phenomena, cyberbullying of activists in China. She urged the government, the media, and the public to care about sexual assault cases on campuses and school grounds, and less about her person. He have further condemned the police, who is also listening to the government in pressuring her. Yeah, ended her criticism emphatically. Shameless um, government, shameless media, and water army. Now, this I have to explain. <laughs> Here, yeah, refer to the internet water army or Wang Luo Shuizun, um, which are um, ghost writers paid by to sway the public opinion according to the government's wishes. Uh, <laughs> thus. Ye articulates a critique of government interference in the public sphere. To comprehend the forces that oppress Ye's subjectivity, it would be useful to go back to Gayatri Shpiva's question, can the subaltern speak? If for Shpiva, the subaltern woman, the subject formation of third world woman, is foreclosed by imperialism and patriarchy, the formation of the subaltern woman activists in China is similarly foreclosed by a patriarchal and authoritarian political order that oppresses and silences female activists. Um, so I'll now explain to you more about the internet problem. The Chinese state has built a legal framework for internet security in the late 90s and tightened its internet regulations after 2004 fearing the political impact of the free flow um, of information. This is known in China as the Great Firewall, which forbids content that is politically sensitive. Even like birth control that I was researching. Um, okay, Sina Weibo is a domestic social media platform that has an internal system of human and software censorship that caters to the Chinese government. In fact, the Chinese uh, government has forbidden the word feminist from Weipo, as it is a bad word, and has a troll army that attacks feminist content online. Some you women are using this term called rice bunny. Uh, in Chinese, uh, it's called me too. <laughs> the homonym. <laughs> a homonym for me too. It makes no sense, right? But it's a, it sounds like me too. Unfortunately, even the use of homonyms and emoji um, related to the need to have been now banned as they, the censors have caught on. Yehayan also complained about the restrictive environment.